Well, I am rather busy. Uh, now he's going to move like right along to McGregor. That's his whole life, you know. Okay, so this is the first episode of the X Files that we have seen that has absolutely nothing to do with the supernatural. Or well, paranormal. it does because you have the flashes to the devil because maybe he's the devil. But yeah, it, it, it seemed like all of those were shoehorned in because it says paranormal activity in the credit sequence. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I feel about those. Well, there's a couple a couple ideas I have about those those brief flashes. I think that they were either stylistic yeah, choices metaphor. that were a little too artistic for a you know '90s television show, uh, or it is also that reason that they were done because people would get confused otherwise that this had become an episode of Criminal yeah. Minds. Okay, so this is uh, I I had seen a very small handful of episodes of the X-Files before this project. This is one of the episodes that I had seen and knowing what I've seen from the rest of this series so far, I guess this is one of the reasons I didn't like the X-Files because this is the kind of this is how it was represented to me. Huh. What do you I don't mean like that? this episode. Uh really? I really I, like this episode. Okay, we're going to have a good conversation. <laughs> um it feels I don't know. In it, it's not a bad episode. It's just not maybe and maybe not maybe it's just not representative of what it of of how good the show gets. Um I don't know. It's it's and maybe it is just because I would like to I like the paranormal shit and I don't know. I, I mean, I like this episode for, yeah. for a couple of very specific reasons. And I, I think key to that is, and I think you'll see this throughout the X-Files, right? I mean, one of the reasons that, that Squeeze didn't work for you is because you did not like yeah. Tombs. You did not buy into Tombs. You, you did not find that character engaging or interesting. And I think that that's true for most of the X-Files. If hmm. you don't find the central mystery of that week's episode interesting or compelling in some way, it's not going to be one of your favorite episodes. Yeah, I... I really, really, really find Donnie a fascinating character, and I love the actor. Okay, I will him. say, like, everyone's like, well, the actor playing Tombs is so scary. I didn't find the actor playing Tombs scary, but no, I have to, I, 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 and, and I, maybe I'm coming a little harder on the episode initially, because you're right, the actor playing uh, Donnie is terrifying here. He's really... He does play him very inhuman in a lot of ways. There is something just very off about him in this. Yeah, he's doing a very, very, very good job at playing uh, the kind of person that is a serial killer. And what I like about this episode in particular is that you get to see a serial killer at the very beginning of their serial killing career. This is not a person yeah. who has murdered b before this episode. And at least that that's the theory that we know of. And I, I really like that. I think that it's a really, really interesting way to go. It's not something that you see in serial killer stories very much. And I think it gives a good glimpse into you know what kind of person uh, how that kind of progression happens and 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 what kind of person is a serial killer even i mean you know he's a, maybe a little too creepy <laughs> he's maybe a little too off putting to be to be realistic but the the fact of the matter is i can definitely buy this guy as uh, a serial killer and and you know yes it's got the the chris carter penned episode problems the the ending voiceover is perhaps a little too didactic and a little too flowery uh it, it, it's it's the plotting is a little messy uh it, it may be its ambition may be outstretching its its reach in 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 a, in a certain sense but on the whole, I just think it's really, really well done. Yeah, no, I, I, and putting in that way, it's true. I mean, you get the implication at the beginning that obviously this has always been his thing to like women's hair, but working at a funeral home and just taking hair from people who don't mind has been the way he's gotten through his urges and getting fired from it in the beginning is what spurs him on to, you know, he loses his supply, right? And when an addict loses his supply, that's when you begin to rob people. So that's essentially what we see happening here. Um, and I, I mean, what I, I love the, I love what Scully is going through in this episode. And I think I like her reactions to everything, maybe more than the plot. Um, I, I, I real, I mean, I, I was really struck and pleased when, at the scene when she's talking to her therapist, for example, um, because it made me, 
I was very happy that a character I liked who is going through troubles is going through is dealing with them in a very healthy way. I mean, it makes sense that I mean, in, in real life, the FBI and co- and police and all and the military do have counselors because you see some fucked up shit uh, and things are you know the 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 job has a lot of pressure and is very difficult to deal with and. Scully is seeing some stuff that's more fucked up than most people, and as the therapist points out, she's had a really difficult year. She is getting help for that, and that makes me feel better. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I mean, I think this is a really strong episode for for Scully and for Gillian Anderson, uh, you know, in particular. And you're right, like, what I like about Irresistible as well is that it is very nicely tied into the the problem year that Mm. scully has had i mean her father has died she was kidnapped uh she may or may not have had an alien baby uh we don't know what was going on with that and it's right like i think that in terms of tying that into the journey of scully in the last season and a half this episode does a really good job with that i also think that it's interesting that the show is able to remind us subtly of what scully has been going through without banging us over the head with it in in a way which is really interesting to me because it 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 indicates the show has a fundamental respect for the audience's knowledge of the show and also it's presuming a level of knowledge of what has come before that that is maybe indicative of the ways in which television is going to go and it is also making the events that happened to her actually have happened to her uh, in a way, you know, this isn't like in a cartoon where a character gets injured and then in the next they're perfectly fine. Scully has been through some extreme trauma and she's still showing the wounds of it. She's mostly fine. Through most cases, she can get by okay. Uh, this one, because of, I mean, obviously in uh, the episode with the nursing home, she is uh, particularly struck by the sexual assault nature of it. Uh She is going to be particularly struck by the assault nature of this crime, particularly when you consider that Gillian Anderson's hair was one of her iconic features. She is going to be very upset by this case. Um, Yeah. Well, well, and I also think, too, that, that, you know, if you look back at the episodes that that have come after Gillian Anderson returned to the show after her disappearance, you know, uh, One Breath, Firewalker... Red Museum, Excelsis Day, Aubrey, and now Irresistible. This is really the first the first case that they've worked that we've seen that has been a very I mean, she's she's having to deal with a level of physical violence to dead bodies that, that yeah. she has not had to look at since before she disappeared. And so there is an indication that she is I mean, obviously she is having a problem with this, not because she is a bad FBI no. agent or whatever. Um there, I mean, there is an indication, of course, that that is is implicit in in her going to see a therapist. Number one, that the FBI, you know, ex- the FBI is aware of the fact that uh, going through a tough time with a case is not an yeah. indication of moral failing. It's an indication that you are a human being, and it's also an indication that that Scully is perhaps uh, retroact or, or sort of de- having a delayed reaction to her very, very stressful events as yeah. well. I mean, we don't, un- we don't know how long Scully has been seeing this counselor. The implication is that this isn't the first time she's gone to her. And so yeah, she probably, ha- I, I mean, to me, it's a reveal that she's been seeing somebody this entire time, maybe. Huh. I don't know. I, I, I got the sense that this was not, uh, uh, I, I got the sense this was the first time she was seeing well, the counselor because the the counselor says things like "I saw in your file that you recently lost your father," like things oh, okay. like that, which which indicate to me that perhaps they have not. Talked okay, no, about I misheard so, that line as well. You recently lost your father, you know, as if she had known what was going on. Okay, yeah, and I think that that it. I mean, it doesn't yeah. really matter that much. I don't think. I mean, either way, she's seeing a therapist, and that's really the point of that scene. And the and the show goes out of its way to make it. Yeah, the show goes out of its way to make it okay that she's seeing a therapist, which is very important. I mean, the normalization of therapy is a good thing. Yeah, I mean, aside from the fact that she kind of has that scene in the you know in the hallway where she's you know staring at the door and. It's kind of a standard, like, I have to go see a therapist now kind of, you know, shot, which is a little cliched. But, yeah, you're right. Like, the actual therapy uh, seems fine. It's it's kind of shot very neutrally. Uh, you know, there's nothing really wrong with it necessarily. And there's an indication that it did yeah. help her. I mean, you know, I, I don't know. 
you know, it's to, to some degree, I think it's interesting that, that Scully is not trusting Mulder with the knowledge that she's having such a hard time with the case. And, it's... you know, I, I think there's something about it which makes her very human because she has had a lot of problems already. And if she wants to hide this from Mulder, I think it's 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 understandable. I mean, she she I think she talk, she does talk about that. I don't think she is reluctant to share it with Mulder because she doesn't trust him or she doesn't think he'll be compassionate to her it's quite the opposite she she's uncomfortable with him wanting to protect her i think she doesn't want she doesn't she is worried i think that showing molder her weakness is going to bring out his protective instinct and that will kind of disrupt the balance between the two of them because right now they are equals they are you know equally tough about this and she i Certainly, when if she were to go to Mulder, we know that he would be fine about it. He would treat it respectfully. He's not going to condescend to her that much. But she, I think she is more worried about that than maybe in reality. Although, I mean, he does have that one conversation with her when he's saying, I don't want to hide if you're uncomfortable. And he is slightly a little too big brother about it in that situation. No, I, I'm totally with you. I, I think that there is an element to which, because it, it it's not, I don't think it's it's uh, a coincidence that this is happening in this episode. I think that, you know, because let's not forget, this is an episode about mm. a serial killer of women who is called a death fetishist only because uh, the apparently Fox broadcast standards would not let them use the word necrophiliac on the air in 1996. Um but it is also the case that that he is calling her girly girl. There is a lot of, yeah. uh, you know, ma- you know, ma- uh, male on female violence in this episode that that is being examined. And I think that having Mulder be a little bit protective of Scully is a subtle way of showing the ways in which even men that are quote unquote good yeah. men sometimes maybe discount the the emotional physical strength of women. Well, even a, a, as radical as Mulder may be as outside society as he may be, he is still in society inside society and there are certain unconscious gender roles that they are going to slip into even if they don't want to, even if they don't mean to. You tell Mulder that, you know, you dude, you're being a little condescending about that. I'm sure he'd be upset and maybe a little horrified and certainly not intending to. That's, you know, it's I I wouldn't say it's his fault or anything like that, but you know, right, at, right. At, at the same time, Scully would want to go out of her way to not kind of trigger that reaction from him because that's not what will help her. Yeah, no, I agree with that. But then what do you make of of the, the, the fact that, I mean, we'll talk about, well, I want to go back to Donnie at some point, but but the spe- specifically the, the end of the episode where, where she is once again the, the sort of damsel in distress. Yeah. And I think that this is something that the show was very, very particularly focused on not yeah. showing in the first season. And, and I don't know if it's like outside pressure i don't know if if because this was written by chris carter so so he created the show he created the characters he went into this wanting to show scully as a strong and capable person not just as a woman I, um but it's also important that she has a strong capable woman of course i'm not discounting that yeah, but they, they, it is the case where like you know what what does it mean that once again Mulder has to rescue her at the end of the well, i mean he only sort of rescues yes they d- <laughs> Yeah, it is ambiguous because she does, as soon as she has the moment to get the drop on him, she does do a hell of a lot of damage while tied up. So, it, you know, they, they do make her very capable within this situation. That said, she does get into the situation. So, yeah, I... I she gets into the situation and she also doesn't get out of it herself. No. I mean, yeah, she sprays him with the bug spray or whatever it is and et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, if Mulder did not have the revelation about Donnie's mother's Or house, had it five minutes later. She would mm-hmm. be dead. Now, of course, that's dramatic tension, but but it is, I don't know. I just, there's something about it that doesn't sit right with me, I guess, especially in an episode that is very focused on the the ways in which men are violent towards and, and I guess like what what bothers me the most about this episode is that the last word goes to Mulder when this is Scully's episode. Scully has several voiceovers throughout the episode when she's talking about the mind of the serial killer and uh, uh, and and all of that. And at the very end of the episode, Mulder's the one who pontificates on the events. It would make more sense for Scully to be 
pondering all of this because this episode has been about her journey through this. And we yeah, don't get yeah. her thoughts at the end of this was a really fucked up situation I, I, I was in. Here's what I learned. Yeah, I mean, I I agree with you. I I wonder if one of the things that that kind of happened with the show as the show went on and became very very popular, of course, is that uh, David Duchovny, very charitably speaking, got a big mm. head. And I don't know if this is an early indication. Maybe he pushed for that voiceover at the end of the episode. He felt like maybe it was he was Scully was getting too much screen time in this episode. I mean, I'm just spinning my wheels here, but it kind of has that feel to me that yeah. David Duchovny went to Chris Carter and said, hey, I think the last voiceover should be mine instead of Scully's. Yeah, I need a few more lines here. That makes sense. It did feel, yeah, it, it, it was just weird, though. Yeah. No, I agree. I totally agree with you. I don't think it works in terms of the, the themes of the episode. And I think that having having Scully pontificate about the nature of, of evil through Donnie would have been a much more, it, it would have been a much stronger way for this episode. I mean, she could have re- read the same exact monologue. It would have been fine. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. They didn't need to change anything. Um, well, speaking of, of Donnie then, I, I think that, again, I mean, I, I like the character a lot, which seems weird to say yeah. for a serial killer. Uh, but he's you know what villain, I mean. Yeah. But he's a good villain. But but also that, that I, I never, as much as I like this episode, I'm never sure about how I feel about his decision to kidnap an FBI <laughs> agent. It it seems so profoundly stupid that I almost find it unbelievable. I don't know that there would have been a better way to make this episode go, but it doesn't seem like... Because I guess you could just argue that there are incompetent yeah. serial killers, and maybe he just was one. I don't know. No, it's but... true. These he 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 would have slipped by if he had just let them. Uh, if he had just let them continue the investigation, they probably wouldn't have figured it out, and it would just go on. Yeah, but uh... right. So 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 why does the show ramp up the the tension so much into having Donnie kidnap Scully? I mean, I think that you could elide a lot of the problems that both of us had with the end of the episode specifically about Scully, you know, once again being the damsel in distress if it had been someone well, else. And if Scully had been the one to make the leap of logic and say, oh, maybe it's his mother. Okay. Well, here's you know what I here's mean? the like, thing. I- there's that whole scene when he becomes the frozen food delivery man and there's the hello well, frozen food delivery man i've never seen come into our house talk to our beautiful daughter with hair go into our bathroom and supervise like i i i assumed that sh- the daughter was going to be one of his targets and again that would be a perfect amount uh, a perfect thing he kidnaps the daughter takes her to his mother's house scully makes the leap of logic saves the girl at the end fine then you give her the ending monologue, and that would have made more sense. That is, and that is also Scully is wondering about her abilities to protect people through this. She went through, you know, her father died, and she was kidnapped herself. Can she still do her job, which is to stop bad things from happening to other people? Well, you know, here she saves this girl from being killed by this guy. She still has her abilities. She just kind of needs to recenter and refocus and just get her shit together and now she's done that. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right because the other thing that makes me think of course is that you know when she makes the decision to to fly back to DC with the I forget what it was but the thing that they were testing for uh fingerprints it, it it's a very interesting choice for a sp- specifically an episode that is about a serial killer with Mulder's background in yeah. behavioral profiling to to make it about Scully and I I think that again there's a little bit of a missed opportunity there in 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 making this even a stronger episode for Scully in a way yeah and I. I think there's something interesting in the beginning where he is – so you have this sher- – the the police guy who's like, well, this has got to be aliens because it's – and Mulder obviously <laughs> knows this is just, you know, a se- – so for him, this is almost a vacation, right? He's got tickets to the game and all right, we're going to, you know, we're going to enjoy ourselves. This is an easy thing. He is treat. Which I just need to point out, the FBI – the FBI <laughs> – that would be more interesting if the FBI played football. The NFL doesn't play on Saturday, so I'm well, not really sure. Well, like, so that's right? the supernatural oh, anyway. elements in this episode. 
Oh, they're actually in an alternate <laughs> universe where the where the NFL plays on Saturdays instead oh my of Sundays. God. I like it. Um, but yeah, I mean, but it could have been very easily fixed because college football gets played on Saturdays. So just make it a college what, football. Whatever. Anyway. Um, e- either way. No, I am not going <laughs> to let this go. This is the, this is my line in the sand. The point is that you have. I mean, this is an example where you have Mulder treating this as a lark and Scully very, very much dealing with the fact that this is somebody who is desecrating the bodies of women and ultimately killing them and him not dig I again yeah. that that's I, I I guess that's it. I you're right. All of the Donnie stuff is very well done. This is a creepy episode, but I feel like there is some sloppiness, some thematic tightening. Make Scully the actual main character of her episode, give her the ending, give her an opportunity to act rather than be acted upon. And yeah. maybe it would be a little stronger. Maybe it would make its point a little better. Okay. I can go with that. Um, maybe the last thing I want to mention before we move on to Dahan de Verlitz is, uh, I kind of love the FBI agent that, that, that works with Mulder in this episode. And I kind of want him to have a spinoff <laughs> of his own because he's awesome and I love him and I hope he comes back in every other episode of the show, even though I know he mm. doesn't. I like, uh, the tech that's obviously has a thing for Scully, but he's too awkward about it. Oh, that's nice, too. <laughs> but then here's another example of, I mean, again, I'm reading that into it. I mean, we certainly had um, the one tech who was, you know, kind of flirtsy with Mulder. But, you know, you have another woman who is, uh, another man who is showing interest in a, co- in a co-worker that may not necessarily be wanted. Certainly, Scully isn't bothered by the interaction or anything. He doesn't cross any lines or anything like that. But it still exists. It still exists, and I, I, I guess you know it, it does wrap back around to the idea of you know something that we've talked about on the show before about you know women are socialized mm. to be deferential to men, et cetera, et cetera. And you know I'm not really sure what this episode is saying. I don't know if Chris maybe, maybe Chris Carter just just isn't uh, isn't woke enough <laughs> to be able to to construct an episode like this. And you know maybe it is the case that that he was doing the best job that he could. And I'm certainly not saying that this episode is sexist in any way. Yeah. And I think it's it's trying. It's hard is in the right place. And you know I mostly like it for Donnie. I mostly like it for the fact that I find it incredibly creepy and well done. But yeah, I think this conversation has shown that a lot of the the you know uh, 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 subtextual elements in terms of its its approach to questioning male female relations or feminism is is perhaps a little half-baked let's okay. say all right well let's move on to Dahan de verlitz which is uh, <laughs> uh ter- ter- terrible oh, oh, it's terrible uh, well see i have to say this episode feels like a high school kid won a contest to like write a script for the x-files and you know they punched it up a little bit but i thought it was ridiculous in the best possible way i fucking loved this episode because it was just it was terrible, but it was one of them. It was really fucking entertaining. Okay, we're just on the <laughs> wrong. We're just on different pages this week. You're gonna have to justify oh, this to me in some way because, was... like, number number one, this was written by Glenn Moore ah! and James Wong, who were not bad <laughs> writers, and so I don't like. What is going on with this? Why did you like this just, so much? This is so bad. It was, I, it was to me. This became so bad. It's good. This is not a great hour of television. This is not. A great episode of the X Files. There is no thematic weight. You could say, yeah, that yeah again. but I mean, this is everything was just so fucking ridiculous. Uh, you have the parent teacher con- council in charge of everything, and they're Satanist. You have this weird substitute teacher who's making them dissect pigs in class. You have uh, uh, eyes and a heart kept in a, kept in a drawer in a co- in a in a high school. You have satanic rituals. You have. A murder basement. I mean, this episode has everything hokey in it. It was, it was a wonderfully hokey episode. The, you know, I appreciate. I think I appreciate camp more than you do in a lot of ways. And this episode hit all of the camp buttons to me. I no, I'm with you. I mean, I well, in both in both cases, I think you do appreciate camp more than I do. And 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 I think this episode was campy. And and I don't know if it was in. Well, can something be intentionally campy? Number I think one, so. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It, 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 it almost feels to me like it was intentionally campy. And again, this sort of presages a little bit of tonal shifts in the X-Files as the show developed. And, and we will be getting to, I think, perhaps one of the first out and outright tonal shifts that the X-Files has in a few weeks. I just, I don't, 
like all that's fine and i think that in terms of camp it's fine but, but what is it about it's so but yeah what's it about it's so half-baked I think that the X-Files insistence on having open-ended endings of episodes so the, the mystery is not completely solved or there's always a, you know an understanding that it could come back is 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 laughably uh uh half half-assed in this episode where she writes a note on the board. I mean it's like <laughs> what is going on? Who is No, like seriously like who is this character? Where did she come so from? So she what is her purpose here, and how did she know what to do, and what the fuck is she even doing? I mean, so my, my, my take on the plot is that, so these four, this absurdly powerful parent-teacher council, again, this is why it felt like a high school kid wrote this, because the high school is the center of everything when, you know, in real life, people barely notice it in the high schools in their town. Is it the, is it the P.T. Slay? No. Uh, so, so you have this group of people who are, you know, worshipping this demon, but they've gone soft on it. They're not doing the sacrifice. They're not worshipping a demon. They're worshipping Satan. Come well, on. yeah, they're they're worshipping Satan or, I mean, they give it another name. It's impl- It doesn't really matter. They are worshipping a devil or the devil or somebody really bad. And they're not doing all of the sacrificing rituals that they really should be. They're doing just you know, lighter stuff they're, they're doing at, at, at one point Mulder makes the metaphor of, you know, grape juice instead of wine for communion and the devil or a devil that they worship gets pissed off that they're not doing it, puts revenge against some of the town at, you know, the, these couple of kids and kills the four of them because they didn't do their job. The end. Oh, it's stupid. Right, so- you no, know, it's stupid. Uh, I, it was a hell of a journey to get to a stupid destination. Sure. I, yeah, I think that's part of it. And I think it's also just like for, for me, the, the, this is an episode like space where Mulder and Scully, mm. like, what are they doing there? They don't do anything. They, they never solve the mystery really. And they just end up like, I don't know. It, it just, they're just there at the end of the episode because they have to be because they're in the main <laughs> credits, but they don't do anything in this episode. I mean, you know, we talked last week about how, you were starting to see the the charms of even in a in a lesser episode of the show or a bad episode of the show that you can sit there and you can watch Mulder and Scully bounce ideas off each other and and it's fun and it, it's entertaining and it's engaging because you like these characters yeah. and you like the way they interact with each other and this episode has really none of that and it doesn't seem like the show was aware of its own strengths. Uh- I mean, this reminded me a little of Buffy in some ways. I know this is pre-Buffy, but yeah, it does seem like an epi- Maybe I mean, could it have been that they wrote an ep- wrote a pilot to a high school-themed supernatural series that, you know, they decided to repurpose for the, the X-Files? No. No. <laughs> That's not how television works. I don't know works. how television works. They don't do that. I thought they did that. Um, no, it, I mean, no. It, it just seems like, the, it seems like a different show that they just shoe Hunter Mulder and Scully in. Uh, yeah, I guess that. Yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's true, and I guess that's really like what is the problem with it is that it doesn't. It fundamentally does not feel like an episode of the X Files, and and I'm trying not. I'm t- I'm talking around something because we haven't gotten to a very specific episode of the show yet, which is coming up in a few weeks. Um, that really does presage, I think, that the beginning of the tonal shift of the X Files or its ability to enhance its its. It's tonal palette, I guess you could mm. say. I mean, certainly the show does still rely a lot on the types of tone and themes and style that it did in the first season and a half or two seasons of the show. And what I'm getting at is that the episode I'm thinking of that's coming up later is able to do that because it leans very heavily into the the Mulder and Scully dynamic and relationship. And maybe this episode doesn't work for me because I yeah. know that they're able to do this a lot better later. Yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, Mulder and Scully are barely in this episode. I can't really I can't really think of much that they do and the stuff that they do is kind of stupid. I mean, I'm thinking about the scene towards the end when, oh, let me tell you the names of the people in the conspiracy. Hang on, I've got, let me handcuff you to a pipe while you're in danger <laughs> and leave. Like, you could, this guy is willing to talk and work with you, and he doesn't in any way seem like he's gonna cut and run. He is, he, he would be fine to be handcuffed in the back of your car. 
<laughs> right. Like I think yeah, that's a like, good point because I, I, I kind of I, I guess a good way for, for, for me to think about an episode not working is when I start to uh, uh, notice plot yeah. holes and I think that was one like that was that was certainly one of them I think the other one was that that kind of half-assed scene when Mulder says I'm gonna get a search warrant for his house and then he shows up in the next shot in the dark with a flashlight <laughs> like cer- like that's not how search warrants work uh, you don't just go to the house and like enter it you you have to yeah. s- serve the search warrant and you don't serve search warrants by yourself because that is really fucking dangerous yeah it's it's <laughs> only because the guy was willing to deal with him is the only reason that Mulder didn't get into either serious legal trouble or very hurt <laughs> right and 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 so and then again of course the 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 other part of that is that he he flees the basement very quickly after he gets that that phone call that that makes Scully sound like she's on Vicodin or something because she's, I guess, being taken over by Beazelbub. I don't. No, know no, I think the the, the, here, but... the 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 evil teacher was using Scully's voice. No, yeah, that's yeah. That, no, I know uh, she 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 stole her pen to perform <laughs> the black magic ceremony to take over her body, and you think that after the events of the previous scene where she took the jewelry yeah. from his daughter and had her. I guess, well, commit suicide in quotes. I mean, she was murdered, but you know, she takes multiple. And apparently you die. Notice her. Apparently you die in like two minutes when you slash your wrists. That's a thing. Yes. Well, that's, (laughs) yeah. Well, we all know that's true. Uh, That, that, you know, she's taking Scully's pen and you're supposed to think, Oh my God, Scully's neck. She's going to kill Scully. And now it's a fake out. And she's only doing it because she wants to get Mulder out of there. Cause I guess she knew that the guy was going to be with Mulder at the time. I like, she could, she see the future. She's the devil. Of course she can. And then, like the python goes <laughs> down there. I, I don't know. Like, and is it like a? Is it a? Is it an evil python? Is it a? Is it a? Is it a a, 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 a? a demonic python that can eat somebody in two minutes? I don't know what the hell. Is, help me here, Richard. I'm really just vamping because it's I don't monsters. know what the fuck is going on. Listen, at the very beginning of the episode, I th- realized that the high school was named Crowley High School, and that's what I realized. I can't take this episode seriously. <sighs> so I, I mean. I had to watch it as a wacky supernatural comedy with some dark elements, and it was good as that. <laughs> like, if you was it? it I, I, I mean, I the scene where she opens the drawer and puts the test papers right on top of the organs that she harvested. I mean, if you didn't crack up laughing at that point, I, 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 I think this episode, it's true, it has no point to it, but that. To find again, I appreciated the ridiculousness of it. This was a stupid episode, and it was so much fun as a stupid episode. I, I find satanic ritual hysteria to be hilarious. Uh, largely, well, that that is that is hilarious. Yeah. We haven't even talked about that yet, so maybe we should talk about that. But I, I don't know. I mean, I guess I'm I'm trying to put myself in in, in your mindset because. I guess I can see it. Like, like, okay, you're new to the X Files. You've never seen any of the other episodes of the show, or, or very, you know, very few, you know, a handful of episodes before. And here you get this episode, and here's a campy episode about Satanist at a high school in, in I think Massachusetts yeah. or Rhode Island or Connecticut or wherever the fuck they were, somewhere in New, New Hampshire. And uh, sure, New Hampshire. Let, let's throw all of them in there: Vermont, Maine. Uh, is that it? Did we name them all? I think we did. Uh, and and so. I guess I can see that, but, and I'm trying to be, I guess I'm trying to be like respectful of that because I just know that the show is able to do this kind of thing a lot better later. And, and I don't know, like it's possibly the case that Glenn Morgan and James Wong just weren't as funny as they thought they were. And maybe just weren't as good at writing episodes like this as they thought they were, because I never really like a lot of the humor in their episodes. I don't think they're very funny. And you know, this is the last episode of the show that they wrote for a couple of seasons. After this, they went off and did Space Above mm. and Beyond. Uh, and I think they come back and write like three or four episodes for, for season four. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I just kind of feel like maybe I, I, I guess it's, I almost feel like they phoned this one. Yeah, in. Like they were already bored with the show. And so they're they're trying to fuck with it because they're leaving or something. Listen, you know I, I mean? admit that a lot of my laughing with laughing was laughing at rather than laughing with. Um 
I don't, I think they intended the drawer on the test papers to be a creepy moment when it was just ridiculous. I, I, I don't think they realized that the idea of a substitute teacher giving a final exam is ludicrous. I, I, I you know, things like that. I, I don't think they understand how high schools actually work. And so, it, yeah, well, that that's a common problem for television in general. Yeah, and so you know that I guess I liked it on that level. This is not an episode I could take seriously, but again, I think the mention of Crowley High School told me you don't have to take this seriously. This is the equivalent of like a comic book, alter, you know, imaginary story episode, right? Like it's not going to be a serious one. It's not going to be a classic, but you know, with those structures in mind, it's fine fast food. Well, I I think that that's clarifying for me because I actually disagree with you. I don't think that this episode was intended to be creepy, or at least some of the moments that I took to be ridiculous were intended to be creepy. Um, You know, I, I, I think that at least part of the problem why this episode doesn't work for me is because it is so tonally yeah. off and and. I think that they did intend some of those scenes to be humorous or campy or or funny or or sardonic, yeah. whatever you whatever term you want to use. I I don't think that this is a failed episode of the X Files vis a vis. This is a standard creepy monster of the week. This is supposed to be Friday night and it's scary episode of the X Files. I think that they were trying to do something totally different with the show and i just think that they failed i think that is very fair to say um i guess i'm just pre- it's one of those i'm pretending it's an and an, it's an anthology series that had a had an x-files crossover <laughs> yeah this is an episode of the outer limits right <laughs> So well let's let's talk about the the Satanist stuff in this episode then because I I'm I'm kind of with you that I find Satanist stuff in general to be kind of ridiculous and and I don't know why people are so freaked out by it. Uh and that and was I also mean, part well, of the reason why Well like well the, I, I think in the 80s some people were legitimately free. We are coming out of like like the D&D scares of the 80s, right? Where people thought that this was a legitimately satanic thing. You and sure. I are coming up this knowing what Dungeons and Dragons is. It's something that we grew up with, something that we knew when we were kids. We understand the use of demons in the series. We understand what it is. We know that it's not really a portal to hell. But put this in the mindset of something – when this is completely new, somebody who may be very conservative, may not be very worldly, and so – you know, you have this panic, but I guess we understand how defanged the tiger really is, right? Everything that Scully says in this episode, you know, when they talk about how, well, those things aren't, re- you know, usually those are killings that are made to look like ritualized killings for, you know, whatever reason. And even the Church of Satan renounces violence and all of that. You know, we... that, But that but that to me is an indication that, again, not, not to cut you off, but, but like where she says... Um, to to the guy, the 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 father, you know, if she's she's going on a rant about Satanism and how ridiculous these these conspiracies are, and she says, you know, if this was true, yeah. this would mean thousands of people murdering tens of thousands of people a year with absolutely no evidence. And he says, and now you understand what we're up against. Like that, is I just almost suppo- wonder- that is supposed to be funny, and it's just not quite working. See, I got the sense that that line was to deflect. I, I actually read that line as him like leaning into her ridiculousness. She doesn't believe that satanic conspiracies actually exist, and so he's oh, no. acting. He's saying, "Well, this is real," so that she's gonna just gonna dismiss him as a crank. But that may be. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. I think. Well. I, I think it can be both things. Honestly. I mean. I think that that it, it is, and I think that that speaks to the the tonal problems of this episode that we're not really sure what the motivation <laughs> of that line was. You know. I take it as a, a, a attempt at being campy, and you take it in, as a as a serious attempt at deflecting. Yeah. Um. You know his his culpability in the own satanic cult of this town. I think it's probably both of those things. I think we're both right. Yeah, but I also yeah. think that it speaks to the the fact that this episode is just fucking all over yeah. the place. It wasn't a great episode, but I laughed and I thought it was – I was – I can't – again, this is – this is something that I say a lot. I've been saying a lot about the X-Files. I've been saying a lot about Voyager. And it's probably the most damning with faint praise thing I can say, but I wasn't bored in this episode. 
No, it's it's not boring. That's <laughs> sure. I mean, when you're you're watching a substitute teacher hand out uh, pig embryos for the kids to dissect, yeah. and I, I I like who who does that by the way. No, I know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I dissected a frog when I was in high school, but I mean, you would not dissect a pig. That seems a little no. Bit some crazy to some me. schools dissect fetal pigs, but the, the either way, I mean. I think they overestimate what substitute teachers do. I mean, substitute teachers usually don't give final exams. <laughs> well, that was supposed to be the mystery oh. of who this woman was. Is she? Nobody remembered hiring her. You know, it's like all that kind of crap. <laughs> You're just like, really? This seems really happy. Uh, now I'm picturing the devil comes to the high school, but like she's really interested in like, you know, taking attendance and like making sure the kids are actually learning and, you know, gets very into the minutia of teaching and so therefore gets reformed and oh my God. And then like 50 years later, you know, Mrs. Potter or whatever her name is, we are your opus. And then she realizes that truly she has affected the world through being a good teacher. Well, uh, and where can we go from there? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I, I do think there's somewhere else to go with that because we did kind of drop the, the Satanist mm. stuff. But I want to say that one thing that I think I can say for it is it is another case of the X-Files being interested in a very weird section of American mm. culture and, and, and trying to do something with it. Uh, again, I'm not sure that it really works, but it, it is the case that I think you could make an episode like this that works i don't think it's this episode but the idea that there is a secret satan is called in middle america well this isn't middle america but yeah you, you know functionally it is small town america uh, sm- right small town america that that is actually murdering people and you have this creepy scene i mean i think the scene oh. with the the his daughter where she is 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 kind of crying and telling all this horrible stuff is is actually really yeah well the uh that that actually is really creepy and and, and scary and moving. here's the thing i mean yeah the and the actress was fantastic in that scene that's that's this is the episode wanting to have its cake and eat it too because she describes this horrific abuse i mean and but we also have to have the father be sympathetic because he is a sympathetic person who is not interested in the more bloodthirsty things of this religion and who you know and all of those things and who ultimately wants to do the right thing quote unquote and who uh renounces his faith when he sees how they're using and all of that and so he has that line where well i think she's taking some stuff that actually happened and conflating that with some media reports and it wants to have it both ways i think an episode which i mean as dark as an episode in which these things actually did happen to this poor girl and where she was actually abused in this way and where yes most of the satanic panics are you know just hysteria and modern day witch hunts and all of that and crazy stuff but in this town because this is the x-files where this can happen this is actually how this is going um but the episode doesn't isn't really and frankly i i i don't think the episode is prepared to handle that weight no i i don't think it is either and that actually makes me me think of something else that that i find interesting about the approach of of the the satanist elements in this episode is that i think one of my issues with satanist stuff in general is the idea that uh worshiping satan is a is a real thing that happens and that satan actually exists and is doing things huh. in the world whereas the reverse is usually not yes. true in, in that kind of story whereas well i think that that's maybe one of the 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 saving graces haha of this episode is that i think the reverse is true mm-hmm. i think that there is evidence in the x files that god exists and is working um through people or 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 is really things are really happening that that have god at their center because i think in an episode like one breath with the yes. guardian angel is a perfect example of that yes no there that 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 the, the the nurse in one breath is a is a divine figure is a suggestion that there is good and e- good uh, a, a good divine force just as there is an evil divine force and Maybe it's biting off a little more than it can chew to have a good and evil, to have a divine layer of this plot and to have an alien layer of this plot because squaring aliens and God is always something that involves a lot of work, right? Whether, I, I, I mean, I personally in my belief structure see no contradiction between the two, but that ha, but that is 
that's an elaborate story. <laughs> and I, I, th- I, I get the sense that the two plot lines, if as they were, will silo each other off from them. There is aliens, and then there is the monster of the week, and there are times that we are intended to forget one or the other. During, I think, yeah. the more alien-heavy episodes we don't want to think about uh, the more divine things. And during an episode like this, we aren't intended to think about aliens in the world. Yeah. Well, I think that, that my last thought about both Irresistible and, and De Han de Verlitz, and you have to say it like that, is Did we look that up what it meant? It means the hand that wounds. Ooh. And fun fact, this episode was not called that in German. It was just called Satan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that, even when the even when the X Files kind of fails, as it fa- kind of failed this week, I think that one of the reasons why I wanted to do the show on the on this podcast and why I'm so still enthralled by this show is that it's ambitious. Yeah, and episodes usually fail because they're trying to do too much, <laughs> and I think I'm okay with that. Yeah, no, this wasn't a lazily done episode in terms of like the props and stuff. You know, they you could tell they had fun making the more wild scenes in this episode i would say oh yeah absolutely i mean this is not a lazy show these were not lazy episodes and and i think that if you think back to an episode like space maybe that's why that episode was 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 so angering for both of us because that episode was lazy and Yeah. yeah i think that that's why this show continues to be interesting yeah they gave it their all all right well i think that's it for irresistible and dihan de verlitz if you have any thoughts on either of these episodes, please head over to tuninginshow.com and leave us a comment. Go to patreon.com slash trackaboutshow if you would like to give some monetary support to our podcasts. The Patreon also supports Trackabout. We release our episode on the Voyager episodes Dreadnought and Death Wish this week. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, we are there. Tuning In Show is our username in all those social media platforms. And as always, please leave us a iTunes review for tuning in. It is the best way for new fans to find the show. Next week, we're going to be talking about the episodes Fresh Bones and Colony. Mac, why do you...